what I would like to know is, can you describe Ethiopians' view of their own culture and country? Because they seem to be a very proud people. Yes. Uh, first of all and foremost, I thank you, those who came to Ethiopia, having the interest to visit. That's it. And yes, we, it includes me, Ethiopians are very proud of ourselves. Not because just of our country, but because of our personality, the hospitality pride that we have. The country that we have is the cradle of mankind. The country that we have is the original place of coffee. And the country that we have hosts the original Ark of the Covenant. And above all, we have the people who live in harmony, regardless of their religion, regardless of their color, regardless of their ethnic group and language. So this is what makes us pride and proud of us. So yes, we are. Ethiopia is a country located along the eastern corridor of the African continent. It is surrounded by Eritrea to the north, Somalia to the east, Kenya to the south, and Sudan to the west. Ethiopia's portrait in the media is flat, dry, bleak, and plagued with famine. However, those who visit will find its physical appearance quite diverse. It boasts beautiful waterfalls, breathtaking landscapes, high mountains, huge lakes, and legendary rivers. Its culture and history is as ancient and rich as the land itself, and its people are some of the warmest one could ever meet. Every African phenotype can be found in Ethiopia. We began our journey in the capital city of Addis Ababa. It got its name from Queen Tetu, the wife of King Menelik II of the 19th century. One day she gazed upon the beautiful landscape she saw from the window of her palace balcony. From then on, she called the place Addis Ababa, which means new flower. Addis is now a bustling city where one can still see its ancient past coexisting with its more modern elements, stately churches, landmark monuments, and the Mikado Market, the largest open-air market in Africa, are just a few of the many things to see and experience. Ethiopia is also home to the remains of Dinkanish, also called Lucy, our African mother of 3.5 million years ago. Her DNA courses through the veins of every human being on the planet. Mm. That's a masterpiece right there. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia has a sizable Coptic Christian population. At Trinity Cathedral, one of the most important places of worship in Addis Ababa, we witnessed a worship service underway. reads from a holy book in the ancient language of Ge'ez. Christmas is celebrated on January 7th in Ethiopia. Let us observe a bit of the amazing Christmas ceremony also at Trinity Cathedral.
Christmas services are more conservative in their approach to worship. And some Christmas services are oriented toward making a joyful noise unto the Lord. The city of Bahadar is home to the beautiful Tizaset Falls, the smoking water. Visitors revel in how the water drapes the 147-foot cliff like a glittering robe. Saturday Market is a family affair. People travel long distances to gather in the marketplace to buy and sell their livestock. Our journey across Lake Abai, commonly called Lake Tana, led us to a peninsula where about 10,000 people call home. There we visited the Yura Kadain Miret Monastery. Huh? <laughs> This is the Church of St. Mary's, and it is here we find the 14th century church with all of its original illustrations of the birth, the death, the life, and the crucifixion of Christ. Follow me as we go in the circumambulatory journey of the inner sanctum of the church. The 14th century monastery has beautifully painted frescoes depicting stories from the Bible. They are still brilliant in style and color. Note the black angels guarding the door to the Holy of Holies. We stopped along the way to see some of the everyday activities of Ethiopians. One sister makes injera, a flat sourdough bread unique to Ethiopian cuisine.
The journey continues to the city of Gundar. We stop to see the hand of God, a natural protrusion from the stunning landscape. We're met by some of the children from a nearby village. We share gifts of school supplies with them. Most people associate castles with medieval Europe, but Africans were building these impressive structures as well. This Gondar castle and this compound only represents a very small part of the Gondar Empire. Um, there were, there were three major dynasties in ancient Ethiopia. First you got the Aksumite dynasty, which was about 1000, 1000 BC. And then you got the Zegwe with, with Lalibela. And then you got the Solomaic, right, which is here. This is the end of the great classical period of all of Ethiopian history. It actually doesn't end here, but this is the high point of it. Now, the, the emperor uh, who installed this castle that, we, that our guide is going to talk to us about in great detail came to the throne in 1636 after, after the death of his father. Uh, actually, the political and uh, social and religious headquarters was not here. It was over 20 miles away from here. So once Fasilus took reign, he brought it here. This was also the end of a constant struggle between Islam and Christianity. The Church of Deborah Bahan Selassie, Light of the Trinity, is another structure built during the Gondarine dynasty. It's known for its depiction of black angels, all with different expressions painted on the ceiling, and brilliant paintings of religious history are chronicled on the walls. Emperor Facilitas also commissioned a bathhouse surrounded by a pool. It's used to celebrate the Timket Festival every January, which commemorates the baptism of Christ. Worshippers immerse themselves in the pool to be blessed by the healing water. Lalibela, a city established in the late 12th century, got its name from its legendary king, Lalibela. He commissioned the construction of 11 rock-hewn churches, making the city one of the most important places for pilgrimage in all of Ethiopia. The city of Jerusalem had been captured by Muslims, making pilgrimage nearly impossible for many Ethiopian Christians. This is Lalibela, the home of Coptic Christianity in Ethiopia. I'm standing before the largest monolithic uh, church 
of the 11 created during the reign of King Ladibella. Uh, there are three types of churches here. There's the monolithic, which means this church is cut from the rock around me. Ladibella is known as the holy land of Coptic Christianity in Ethiopia. And for all intents and purposes, this is the holy land for all of Christianity. Lalibela is home to many monasteries. One in particular is located atop Asherton Mountain, 12,000 feet above sea level. The trek is two hours each way and takes adventurous travelers up the mountain by mule and by foot. Those of us who made it to the top were rewarded with seeing the treasures of the Asherton Monastery, the stupendous view, and the satisfaction of having climbed Mount Asherton. You can see on the book, on the left, on the right side, you can see St. Mary holding Jesus Christ. And you see Jesus Christ with his two fingers pointing. Some of them, for instance, the Catholics, they say it shows, or he is deliberately showing that his dual nature, wait, just, his dual nature. But in Ethiopian Orthodox Christian, we have the history. When she was fleeing to Egypt, right, she was thirsty. Nobody was interested to give her any water. So he pointed out in the desert, and the water comes out and she drinks it. So it is just to point and to, to, to indicate such history. The miracle of St. Mary is 13th century. It has almost, you can say, 700 years old. Mm. This one is 18th century, recent one. You can see also the colors. Mm -hmm. They are a little bit bright, and St. George, Jesus Christ, St. Mary, having Jesus Christ the 12 apostles <clears throat> and you know a saint from Egypt Alexandria I will not go around my first campus. so this is the paintings that's the point <laughs> My name is Sege Maria Melissa. My name is Samakasa. I'm a waiter. I'm with us. I'm Kwan. I'm Kwan. Welcome to Lalibela in Mount Jambikote. What are you making? Smith's papaya. Oh, wonderful. Fresh papaya. Fresh papaya? Yeah. Okay. I get into some too, right? <laughs> what are you gonna say now? I wanna get I wanna get a chef preparing. Yes. I tell you. Yeah man, I'm coming. Yes, <laughs> yes. Phineas, the baddest chef in, in the world. Yes. I man, I tell soup. Beets. Yeah. It's very good. It's coconut, coconut oil. Right. Strip the coconut oil. Yeah. Then it's got some beans. Right. Yeah, let me show you. They, they kind of be soft. They mash out, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go, here we go. This is very delicious. Oh, okay. Wonderful. How long have you been a chef? Almost five years, six years. Right. Still going through. Yes. Right here in Lalibela. All right. Doing things what I never did in Addis in Lalibela. Right. Where there is not many branch of um, vegetable, but we just use what we have yes. to make our people feel good, our guests. They have a good stomach, living good. Right. When they come sick, we fix them up. Great. That, that's, why, that's why this is my fourth time at this hotel. Right. All right.
We continued our journey, which led us to the city of Aksum. Aksum was once called Abyssinia and was Ethiopia's ancient capital. Makeda, the legendary queen of Sheba, reigned in Aksum, and her palace remains still stand as a testament to her glory. This is the palace of Queen Makeda, 9th century BC construction. I'm standing in one of her uh, guest room areas. Uh, this structure holds more than 50 rooms, including her throne room, baths. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the palace. Evidence of a bathing room and a kitchen equipped with a brick oven are still there. There was also a drainage system. Archaeologists believe an altar in the palace was the resting place for the Ark of the Covenant. There's no doubt that during Queen Makeda's reign, her palace more than suited her position as royalty. The Ark of the Covenant is said to reside in St. Mary of Zion Church. It is forever guarded by life-appointed monks. Axum's Tekenu compound, also called stela or obelisks, are made from single blocks of granite. The tallest one, now fallen, once stood 108 feet high making it the tallest monolith in the world. Most of the Tekkenus are not decorated, but the few that are were said to represent multi-storied buildings. Some argue that they are fertility symbols, and some scholars say that they were used to draw energy down from the sky. None can dispute, however, that these amazing monuments are among Ethiopia's grandest structures. Yes. Ethiopian hospitality is exceptional and we were happy to be invited to the home of our host. Uh, okay, you want fork? Yes, sir. Good. <laughs> His family prepared an amazing traditional meal. It was absolutely delicious. Lamb. After our meal, we were invited to have coffee. Since Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee, it stands to reason that their daily coffee ceremony is an important part of their social life. The ceremony is also performed to welcome guests. The preparation takes raw coffee beans to a finished cup of coffee. It takes a while to prepare, so don't be in a hurry. The beans are thoroughly washed and roasted. They are ground by hand using a mortar and pestle. Water is poured into a traditional clay coffee pot and the ground coffee is added. The coffee is perfectly brewed and served in small ceramic cups. To prevent coffee grounds from finding their way into the cups of coffee, it's poured at a height of at least 12 inches above the cups. Coffee is usually served along with a big bowl of popcorn. Who needs a coffee bar when you can have a fresh cup brewed to perfection right at home? On the last evening of our wonderful journey, we were treated to culture night. We enjoyed the music and dances that represented different Ethiopian ethnic groups. 
And of course, we ate more fine Ethiopian cuisine. It was exquisite. <laughs>